Keita Williams, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, so this is a bit of a strange recording for, for me this evening. It is uh, 12.30 a.m. here in Canada, and uh, you're joining me from Australia. Yes, from uh, just a bit north of Brisbane. All right, excellent. And uh, you're a marine biologist, so I guess that means that you've almost always lived by the coast. Uh, yes, I was I was lucky to grow up um, about half an hour away from uh, the coast, uh, easy driving distance to a lot of beaches. And I used to spend a lot of time as a kid looking in rock pools and uh, finding some really cool creatures, which is kind of what sparked my interest in marine biology. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, a lot of kids when they when they they're thinking of careers, you know, growing up, they think, you know, I want to be a marine biologist. It's a very common thing for a child to have, um, I guess, a sense of curiosity about the ocean. Is that really what got to you? Yes. Well, I I think there was kind of uh, two influences. So as a little kid, I really loved watching The Little Mermaid, the movie. It just sparked my imagination so much. So there was that influence, um, a movie that I just loved and watched over and over again. Um, And then when when I was a kid, I I distinctly remember looking in a rock pool and my sister had found this funny uh, sea slug called the sea hare. Um, And I'd just never seen anything like it before. It was this sort of soft, squishy thing. And I I knew that there were were slugs and snails um, on land, but I hadn't really known that there were uh, marine ones. And I remember thinking how amazing it would be to study something like that as a job. And so that's kind of, again, those two interests, I think, combined as a kid and made me want to study marine biology. What kind of comments do you get from other grown-ups when you tell them that you're a marine biologist? Um, Well, generally a bit of interest. In Australia, everyone's aware of issues like coral bleaching and, um, you know, everyone is interested in the Great Barrier Reef and and do care about marine life. So. People are generally interested, um, but but particularly are aware of uh, like think issues like coral reef bleaching, but maybe don't know too much about what other things marine biologists study because there's there's just a huge uh, amount out there that people study from um, you know particular animals from fish to things like sponges and sea grasses and all kinds of um, of different topics. The thing that uh, most excites me about the fact that you're here is because I'm actually planning to move to the East Coast um, sometime next year, depending on the pandemic and everything. Yeah, uh, and, and I know nothing about the ocean. I mean, I know a little bit. I've seen it. I've, I've, I've been to Portugal. I've been to France. I've seen the, the Atlantic Ocean. But I don't know much about its creatures. And you just mentioned the word seagrass. I don't know what that is. Um, so I want to ask you a ton of questions about that. Uh, let's actually start with seagrass. What exactly is seagrass? Uh, well, it's, it is what it sounds like. Um, there is a whole lot of um, different varieties of seagrass in the ocean. And they, they form these meadows underwater. They are actually called meadows. And um, they're places where, um, for example, uh, very young fish will spend a lot of time um, in the early stages of their life. There's uh, things like stingrays and uh, lots of snails and all kinds of different animals will be in the seagrass. So uh, that's not, not something that I study particularly, but a lot of people do study seagrass and it's kind of um, an important part of the marine environment. So there are places uh, not far from where I live that there are important seagrass meadows um, that, that are well studied and, and things like how the the seagrass might get disturbed when there's development on the coastline and what that can do for the animals that live there and or pass part of their lives in the seagrass. So there's all these interesting environments um, that form part of the marine environment that a lot of people don't know about. So like seagrass, like uh, mangroves, which are very important, um, and there's a heck of a lot of mangroves in Australia, so they, they are a really important part of ecosystems as well. So there's a heck heck of a lot that marine biologists can study, um, aside from the things that people usually imagine, like dolphins and whales and and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Quick question. Is seagrass green? Yes, it is green, yes. Oh, it is. Okay. For some reason, because it's in the ocean, I was imagining that it might come in various colors, like red and blue and purples. And there's a lot of color in the ocean, isn't there? There is. And and lots of algae can come in in amazing colors, um, different reds and and sort of olives and 
um, really lovely greens. So that's, yeah, that's a lot of variety. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Um, you specialize in one thing in particular, which is sponges. I don't know anything about sponges. Why don't you tell me maybe what exactly it is that you studied? Okay, well, um, I didn't know a heck of a lot about sponges either in, until I did my um, research year for my honors project. And I joined this lab that does a lot of research on a particular sponge that comes from um, this this beautiful island, Terran Island, which is on the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. And uh, this is a, a kind of a grayish blue sponge um, that grows in this area. And um, the lab that I joined studies it, um, the genetics of, of this sponge and um, how it develops over time. Um, and my project was looking at the stem cells of this sponge and how they shape the body plan as the sponge grows during the juvenile stage. Um, so that sponges have an extremely changeable body shape. Um, and you might not really think looking at a, an animal that doesn't move, um, but sponges have, have a really what what's called a plastic body plan. So it changes all of the time. Um, it can be shaped by currents. It can be shaped by surrounding organisms and uh, whether there's food available. Um, so these stem cells that are an important part of the sponge will really shape how the sponge develops and how its body changes um, all of the time this is happening. And so my project was looking at factors that shape the movement of these particular stem cells in the sponge. Okay, now, hold on here. You just said that a sponge is an animal? Yes. <laughs> yes. I and didn't there, know that. And a sponge is a very, very old animal. So um, there's, there's kind of a debate about um, the early branches of life um, and and whether sponges or um, another really interesting animal called a comb jelly, whether which one sort of came first, um, because sponges are very interesting, is that they're so unlike other animals that they can kind of be more defined by what they lack in their body than what they actually have, um, which is very interesting. So, um, they're, but they're a very, very old form of life. Um, and, and you tend to think of a sponge as just that sort of, funny texture that that we're all familiar with from like a bathroom sponge or, or something that just sits in one place and doesn't move um but what's really interesting about uh sponges is that they in that earliest form the larval state they actually can swim around and they the, the larvae of this sponge that i was studying they're very cute they're these small little dots that look like tic tacs and they just swim around and they find a place to settle and uh, that can take maybe a couple of days for them, and uh, they they might settle on a piece of um, algae and then slowly spread out into like a little spider web sort of form, and then they become sessile, so they don't actually really move, but their body plan, like their body changes a lot, and the cells move around a lot. Um, so they're an interesting animal, even for something that doesn't look like it's really doing anything. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to admit, I'm still hung up on the fact that it's an animal. Yeah, so they, like, they seem I, I, sort of plant-like, don't they? But but yeah, they are absolutely. Animals. Yeah, I thought maybe it was some sort of like lichen or some sort of fungi. I had no idea it was actually an animal. So you're a scientist. Maybe you, you can explain to me what exactly makes it an animal. Um. Well, you know, they do. There's there's a lot of things that make them an animal, but um, you know, they do they do kind of have an active. Um, stage of life is in this larval state and they do filter feed um, so they don't just you know obtain um, everything they need from sunlight um, like plants do so they do actually um, feed on on lots of things in the water on bacteria um, things that are sort of suspended that they can and sponges can filter at an incredible rate it's quite impressive um, there are uh, people who will put a special dye in the seawater, and then you can see the sponge filtering the water when the dye is visible. Um, so they kind of look like they're not doing anything, but they're actually a very active creature. All they're built to do is basically filter large volumes of water. And amazingly, there are even these type of deep sea carnivorous sponges that feed on tiny animals um, as well. So rather than just matter that's suspended in the water, there are ones that are carnivorous as well. So they're a, a really quite an interesting thing. And, 
And again, it, it's something you tend not to really think about until you start uh, researching them, but they're an unexpectedly interesting organism. Yeah, that sounds really, really cool. Of course, the next question that comes to mind is how do they reproduce? Um, well, I, I like a lot of things, um, uh, a lot of uh, marine life will kind of release larvae um, kind of at all times. So, so these sponges um, that we were using in the lab, you can induce them to release their larvae by um, heating them up. So um, uh, it's, it's not all sponges do this, but um, this sponge is, is a very reliable, useful one for the lab because if you just heat the water temperature um, by a few degrees and, and keep it heated for some time, they will just release sometimes 100 larvae um, within a few hours. And then you can just collect them and um, induce them to settle and then um, use them for different experiments. So, but, but some sponges will just continually release larvae. Um, and then I, I suppose other sponges, it may, they may have a more sort of synchronized event, like uh, the way corals will spawn all at once. Um, so it can vary depending on, on uh, the species. So when you, when you say that it can release larvae, it's because it's like an asexual reproduction, right? Um, again, it can vary, I think, um, <laughs> d you know, depending on species. So, so some, um, uh, a lot of sessile creatures, um, marine creatures will, um, reproduce like asexually. So like cloned versions of themselves and some of them will release, um, their gametes, which will mix and then create, um, you know, the next generation. So it can kind of vary. Okay. And so... Now I'm really, really curious about sponges. I hope you don't mind all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, is it uh, safe to hold a sponge in your hand? Generally, yes. Um, so a lot of these sponges, um, they're pretty harmless. Um, some of them can cause like a little bit of a contact rash or something. Um, I haven't had that issue before, but but there are maybe some some that may, depending on you and depending on the sponge, cause a little bit of a reaction. Um, similar to some anemones have a bit of a sting that can kind of affect you, others won't. Some corals can um, can cause sort of rashes and stinging, and um, but a lot of them won't either. It's sort of, um, you know, it's it's best to to wear gloves or something when you're handling a lot of these um, kind of animals. But um, generally, they're pretty harmless. Okay, and are they pretty much in every ocean in the world, or just around Australia? Oh, every ocean. Um, there's a, a, a lot of very interesting deep sea sponges. Um, so like I said, the carnivorous ones, um, and also these beautiful, uh, glass sponges, which, which construct these, um, well, these beautiful bodies that have a lot of silica. So, um, hence why they're called glass sponges. And those are quite beautiful. Um, some of them can be, form these kind of beautiful gardens underwater. So, um, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a fantastic video going around um, YouTube and Twitter of this incredible sponge garden um, that was found during a deep dive. And they all kind of, they look like a Dr. Seuss um, creation. And uh, the one, one scientist, uh, Chris Ma, described them as a forest of the weird. And that, that was the name that kind of stuck. But they, so sponges can take these really beautiful shapes. They can grow to be huge. They can be extremely old. Um, there's huge barrel sponges that can be extremely old. Um, so they can take a, a real variety of shapes. Um, the sponge that um, the lab I was part of studies, um, it's kind of more of an unassuming, um, like that sort of bluish gray color and kind of an encrusting um, sponge. But some of them can, can have these, yeah, very interesting, beautiful shapes. And they're found all over the place. There are even freshwater sponges as well. Um, but most That's of them what I heard really on good. Twitter. I heard that on Twitter that there was a scientist who was trying to get, actually, I don't remember their name, but they were looking for a grant because they desperately wanted to study freshwater sponges because there's not enough research done on them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't, I don't know too much about freshwater sponges. I just know that they exist. But um, yeah, it would be very interesting to study. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I want to ask you a few more questions about uh, sea creatures. I have to admit, uh, one of my biggest fear is the jellyfish, because I, I'm terrified that 
for some reason, I'd probably react to the sting or something. You know, it's it's irrational. Um, well, I'd, but say I, it's, I'd say it's not irrational. In in Australia, we do have some some rather scary ones, um, like the box jellyfish and the irukandji. So they you're unlikely to come across them, but they can be dangerous. Um, and we also get um, blue bottles here, which they're also called uh, Portuguese man of war, and they're actually not a jellyfish. They're um, they're a hydrozoan, which is slightly different. But but they, you know, to look at them, they look a lot like a jellyfish. But they can give you quite a nasty sting, um, and some people react worse to them than others, and and also it can affect children more and, and things like that. So it's always best to be a little bit wary of jellyfish, but they're a, a very magnificent animal as well. Yeah, I find them beautiful, especially the man of war. Uh, I think uh, anybody who's listening to this podcast should actually Google man of war uh, because it's a most beautiful creature. It's got purple hues and blues and pinks and all sorts of things. Uh, Kita, do you happen to know if I were to wear a full body wetsuit, could they sting me through that? Um, well, a wetsuit will give you a lot of protection. Um I've gone snorkeling before wearing what is called a stinger suit in Australia, which is quite thin. It's not as thick as a wetsuit, but it will cover your whole body. Um, and that, that will protect you from things like blue bottles, the, the Portuguese man of war, um, and other jellies. Um, as long as you can avoid sort of direct contact with the skin, it's usually fine. Um, if you're, if you're really unlucky, um, then it's possible that, you know, a, a stray, um, tentacle could still get in, you know, in part of your suit, but you'd have to be very unlucky. So as long as, you know, most of the time, unless there's really particular conditions and there's a heck of a lot of jellyfish around, it's unlikely that you'll come across one. Um, but yeah, sometimes there are, are conditions where there's a lot of them at once. Yeah, I've heard about that. I know that in Portugal, they, they close the beaches if there's if they even see one uh, yes. Portuguese man of war because they're so dangerous. And well, they've actually I, started seeing them in, on the East Coast, too, of Canada. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. well I actually went out last week looking for them because um, uh, there's a few beaches near me where if, if a lot of these Portuguese man of war start washing up in large numbers, you can also find this very beautiful sea slug that feeds on them. Um, so it's known as a blue dragon. And they're a really tiny sea slug, but they look sort of blue and silver, like they have these little wings. Um, and, and they wash up sometimes at the same time. So last week I was out looking for blue bottles and for these blue dragon, um, sea slugs as well, but I didn't manage to find any, um, of the sea slugs. I have found them, uh, last year around this time of year. So I'm hoping that again, the conditions will be right and I can find some. Um, they're very tiny, like the size of your fingernail, but they're a very beautiful, very interesting animal. Um, this, this little sea slug, it feeds on the blue bottles and then it will, it will keep their stinging cells and use them itself for its own defense, um, which is just an amazing thing to do. A lot of, um, marine animals can do that if they can feed on something and take special cells from that, um, prey and then keep them functioning in their own body as a defense mechanism. It's really amazing. That is really, really cool. And I'm really glad that you brought up the blue dragon. I don't usually um, prep a lot of notes before I do a podcast interview, but I did write down the blue dragon again, because I found it beautiful, but I didn't know that it could actually inherit cells from, um, from the jellyfish. Uh, and that it's common. I didn't know that. And I wonder well, too, if there are, I wonder if there are practical applications like in uh, biomimicry or biodesign to kind of use that research to apply to humans. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it is. Um, there's a lot of, uh, interesting research that can be done. Um, this kind of, uh, um, stealing of different cells from like a, a prey item and incorporating them is something that, um, it does happen a lot in sea slugs. So maybe some sea slugs will feed on sponges or different types of algae and then they'll use the materials to maybe create a chemical secretion or, um, sea hairs will, can create their own ink, a bit like an octopus creates ink. Um, but they, they'll kind of use it from, uh, the algae that they feed on. So they might produce a kind of a purplish, reddish ink um if they feel threatened as a deterrent or maybe it has a chemical that um you know potential predators don't like 
So there's a lot of this really interesting um, behaviors that a lot of um, different sea creatures can do. And, and so you do find it in sea slugs um, a fair bit. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely curious. I mean, the ocean holds such, um, uh, I mean, it's gigantic, right? I mean, yeah. it is, th there are creatures in there that we still haven't really discovered, I don't think, and, and that we're still identifying new species of, of, of little creatures, microscopic creatures. Um, I know for a fact that marine tardigrades have not been fully documented in Canada. Yeah. So I can yeah. only imagine what it's like you know, underwater. And, and I think that's why I'm bringing up, you know, a variety of topics because, you know, like the jellyfish thing is something I'm terrified of. But at the same time, there's a fasc fascination with, with the jellyfish because yes. what unique, what a unique creature it is. Yes. And, and again, a very old one. Um, and, and what's interesting is that um, when you have animals that have a really strong venom, it can be very useful in medicine to study um, you know, how it affects the brain and how it affects, um, you know, your nerves. And, and it can be used for, um, I, I imagine, lots of different applications, but, but um, determining how to treat pain in, in, in uh, you know, lots of different um, scenarios. And uh, there's, there's just so much room for practical research into, um, one example is uh, barnacles. So, um, as most people would be aware of what barnacles are, they kind of, they, they're actually a kind of crustacean, but they encrust lots of different, um, surfaces. So rocks or say a jetty or something. Um, but they actually secrete their own kind of glue and it's incredibly strong glue. Um, so that even after the, the barnacle actually dies, its shell will kind of stay attached to whatever it was attached to. And so there is research into that kind of glue because it could be used for things like dentistry. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff that uh, different animals do, um, marine animals, that, that's really useful for in a lot of different ways. It's, it's very cool. Absolutely. Uh, venomous creatures. There are many of them in the ocean. And like you said, like, you know, their venom is interesting. Um, what is it about so venomous creatures i think in mostly in um in snakes perhaps they tend to be more colorful is that the case with the ocean um it's hard to say just speaking generally a lot of um a lot of animals do try and kind of advertise the fact that they're toxic or venomous um and a lot of that is communicated through color um but of course, we have to remember that the way we see color can be very different to how a sea creature sees color, um, because colors change in the water. Um, so, you know, red disappears um, quite quickly um, at depth. And, and so um, sometimes a, a fish or something that to us looks really brightly colored might really look quite drab or almost invisible to another sea creature as well. Um, so there's interesting research into color vision in different um, sea creatures because it's actually can be very different to how we perceive color. Um, but yeah, a lot of things will advertise that they're not going to be good to eat. So a lot of sea slugs, for example, will be extremely gaudy, bright colors and patterns. Um, and that, that may communicate that they're either sort of toxic or have some kind of chemical defense, um, or that, uh, they're maybe mimicking something that does have that kind of defense. Um, so yeah, it, it depends on the animal, but some 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 fish that are venomous actually aren't super brightly colored. Like um, stonefish can be very brown and kind of yeah, you could easily step on one um, because they're they're not obvious, but they do have a very potent venom. Um, so actually, a while ago, my sister and I were looking in a rock pool, and she found a kind of a white thing which she thought might be a shell or something. It turned out to be a fish. Um, quite a small fish, but it, it looked a bit like a stonefish. So we very carefully caught it in a container without touching it um, and took some photographs. And then it turned out it was a scorpion fish. So they do have a kind of a venom and they're related to stonefish. Um, so we were very lucky we didn't touch it. We were trying to be extra careful. Um, but yeah, they can sting you. But this one was mainly white um, with some kind of models patterns on it. And um, wow. they'll only kind of sting you if you accidentally stand on it or grab it with your hands really um so it's just as a 
as a defense. They're not sort of trying to be aggressive, you know. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was an interesting find that fish, but I'm I'm really glad we didn't touch it. What's interesting about uh, what you just said is that you mentioned that you were rock pooling, and that's something that I really want to do when I move out to the East Coast, again, because I really want to explore the landscape. I want to explore the creatures. Um, explain to me a little bit about what, first of all, let's let's just tell people what exactly is rock pooling. Um, well, that's uh, uh, just a, a casual name for looking at rock pools and, and things on the shoreline at the beach. Um, some people also just call it tide pooling. Um, depending on where you are in the world, you might say tide pool rather than rock pool. Um, so at low tide, when there's rocks and um, sort of shallow areas exposed, you can find a lot of really interesting things um, and sort of wander along and look for shells, um, bits of seaweed, you know, anything you like. Um, but it's something that I've done since I was a kid. I've always loved looking in rock pools and trying to find different animals. Um, so sea slugs, if you're if you're lucky. Um, Near where I live, they can get quite big. There's a type of sea slug um, called the sea hare because they look like they have little ears. Um, and they're always really fun. Um, different kinds of crabs, sometimes um, things like um, uh, sea urchins, um, starfish. You know, it kind of depends on where you are as to what creatures you'll find. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun. So I always like to take a bucket, maybe a spoon or something to, to sort of lift things up. Um, and have a look without directly touching them. Um, another good thing to take is maybe just a small container and a paintbrush. So if you lift up a rock and flip it over, maybe you'll find something interesting on the bottom of the rock, like a little brill star, and you can you can kind of gently get it off with a paintbrush and put it in a container and have a good look at it. Um, so there's just a lot of fun things you can do. Um, there's people who like to go and look at rock pools, um, maybe as it's just getting to dusk, um, because you might see some different creatures. And if you bring out a black light, some things will kind of look very different or um, different anemones and things can be very bright under a black light. So there's a lot of different ways that you can check out uh, what's going on in rock pools. I wonder if that's also the case with the East Coast of Canada. I mean, I know that um, I was uh, I did an interview with Kelly Brenner, and she did mention something about the uh, the the uh, sea slugs and you know finding all sorts of little creatures even in the winter time. Um, I wonder if on the East Coast with the with the black light, if if that would also show up. You know, if some creatures would show up there too. Yes, yeah, I'm sure they would. It, it would um, it would be interesting to find out what. Uh, are the common species around there. Uh, a good place to check out what can be near you is to go on iNaturalist. Um, and, you know, you can, you can have a look at where your nearest beach that has sort of exposed rocks and things at low tide um, and see what kind of species people might be reporting in that area. Um, so it can, oh, it can be idea. surprising. You know, some of the beaches I've been going to for years and years, occasionally you stumble across something you've never seen before. Um, it's, it's good fun. You know, this week I found a crab that I've never seen before, a really big one um, that kind of plays dead as a um, as a defense. Even though it looks kind of scary with these big claws, it just kind of sits there and, and doesn't really react if you if you sort of gently touch it. Um, so, yeah, all, all kinds of things you can find, even if you go to a, a place regularly. Uh, one of the things that I'm really used to doing, or that I've started doing in, in recent years, is collecting fresh uh, freshwater pond water. Uh, so usually in the spring, I'll, I'll grab a big jar and I'll collect, you know, a little bit of the, the dirt, a, little, a few stones, um, a few little underwater plants, and I'll create like a, a freshwater jar. And I'll put it by the window and I like to observe the life, um, you know, that occurs in there. Is that something that can be done with uh, saltwater creatures, or should that be avoided? Hmm, it, it kind of depends. Um, I have in the past when I've had um, a microscope um, at home set up, um, I, I will sometimes collect like a, a clump of algae and a bit of sponges and other stuff um, that have a lot of things clinging to them and bring that home and have a look at. But, but if it's sort of only kept in a small container it will die very quickly without enough like oxygenation of the water and um and kind of more fresh salt water so unless you have a big uh tank set up you could only really keep sort of a jar of of, of salt water and, and little um animals in it for maybe a day or two 
Um, so I try and return it to the beach when I'm um, finished looking at it, if that's for a few hours or overnight. Um, because sometimes you can find really great, like tiny starfish, brittle stars, um, and interesting sort of snails and, and things like that. Um, but I do try and return them pretty quickly. Okay, so it might be okay if I found like a, a really small starfish, brought it home, photographed it properly, brought it back to the beach the next day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had a great and time with um, my friend recently. I took him rock pooling for the first time on the Gold Coast. And we just, we took a lot of different containers so we could photograph everything while we were there. Um, and we also had a little, uh, like a magnifying lens that clips onto your phone. Um, so we could kind of take some good close up images of things. Um, so it, it's, it's fun to do that when you're there at the beach. So you at least don't disturb anything too much and you can just put it straight back when you're done with it. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. And just to be clear, I guess uh, not touching anything would be very wise, wouldn't it? Well, just being a bit cautious. Um, so a lot of things are safe to handle. Um, but if in doubt, then, you know, just keep some distance between yourself and the animal. So, so things like sea urchins, a lot of them are safe to handle, but some of them aren't. They could give you a bit of a, a sting or um, some of their spines are very brittle and could break off on your fingers. So, um, you know, it, it's good to either wear like some dive gloves if you're handling things or just use something like a, a spoon or a paintbrush or something to um, maybe touch or move something an animal but without directly touching it with your skin just to be safe um so that's why it's always good to bring some some extra tools with you i think when you're going rock pooling yeah i'm really excited to actually try it out i think it'll be really interesting you know as somebody who is obsessed with microscopic life in the freshwater ponds of of ottawa um i think it's going to be really interesting to see what i can find in the ocean um is there something that you've been looking for and haven't found yet Oh, there's a lot of things, yes. Um, at the moment, I'm kind of obsessed with bubble snails. Um, so they are, are kind of like a sea slug, but they have more of a shell um, that's still present. So a lot of sea slugs have a very reduced internal shell, but bubble snails are a bit more um, kind of halfway between. They're like a, they have a shell, but most of their body is very frilly and kind of comes out and covers the shell a little bit. Um, and they can be very beautiful. They, they can have... Um, stripes and, and really beautiful colors, um, like a soft pink, or they can have blue edges. Um, very, very beautiful. And they produce a lot of a protective mucus when they um, like cruise around through the sand. So they're just a, an interesting and very beautiful uh, little animal. And I really want to see one. Um, I've gone to a few places where they have been found, but I haven't been lucky yet. Um, so that's kind of, that's, that's a goal is to see a bubble snail. Um, there's, yeah, there's, there's tons of things, um, all kinds of different moody branks and other sea slugs are just really beautiful. Um, I've always wanted to see a hammerhead shark. Um, they, they do sometimes migrate past, um, the coast, um, of Queensland, but you have to go diving to see one and, and be quite lucky. Um, I've seen different kinds of sharks, but, um, nothing like a hammerhead yet. So that would be very fun. Um, yeah, there's just there's so much out there um, that I that I really want to see. Yeah, um, I think you're just lucky to have seen real life sharks other than the hammerhead. I mean, <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So my um, my favorite is uh, the epaulet shark, which is a really small um, shark that kind of shuffles around on its fins at low tide um, in different places, and and they're very interesting. Um, in a lot of research because they can survive um, really low oxygen environments. Um, so that's that's really interesting for brain research. Um, and they're just a very beautiful little shark, but also quite placid. So you can get quite close to them and they don't tend to swim away. Um, so that, that's quite nice. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of very interesting shark species and a lot of them are very docile. Um, so unless you really bother them, they're not gonna bother you. Um, so yeah, quite a fan of different kinds of sharks. Hmm. And you also scuba dive, don't you? Uh, I haven't for a few years, um, but I have I have scuba dived a little bit, yes. Um, there's a lot of really great places around um, Australia that you can go scuba diving, um, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it seems like it's obviously the ideal location. Uh, are there any creatures that, when you go diving, that are perfectly okay to uh, 
to kind of be friendly with? Um, you know, are there like turtles or big fish that you can kind of pet when you're underwater? Well, a general rule is that you shouldn't really try and touch anything. Um, you know, give everything kind of a healthy distance. Um, you know, uh, people will sometimes interact with um, different animals if, say, they've got, you know, something tangled on them, like fishing line or, or something like that. But as a general rule, you, you try not to touch anything um, too much. Uh, like some turtles will be very relaxed and you can get kind of close to them, but but it's still best to avoid sort of touching them or, or bothering them too much. Um, but if it's something like a sea cucumber, um, people do tend to pick them up and have a bit of a look, um, but just, you know, being very gentle with them. Um, but yeah, when, when scuba diving, it's, it's, it's good to just kind of observe everything, but from a little bit of a distance, but there's a lot of things you can get very close to. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun to, um, to see some really, really interesting animals up close. Um, things like manta rays as well, they're, they're very big and they're, um, they're similar to stingrays in, in their sort of body shape, but they're harmless. Um, but they can be very curious. So sometimes, uh, they'll approach divers themselves and have a good look and, and swim around in the bubbles that um, come out of the scuba gear and, and sort of, uh, yeah, check people out when they're scuba diving as well. So sometimes the interest kind of goes both ways. Yeah, I asked the question because, you know, like um, I'm from northern Ontario, which is pretty much the wilderness of Canada. And so, of course, we always tell visitors or tourists not to interact with the animals, uh, you know, the bears, the moose, the deer, the porcupines, obviously, uh, they're all wild animals, you don't want to mess with them. But there are, like you said, you know, sometimes curious wild animals, especially birds, some of them will land on you. Um, so of course, I was curious, because underwater, of course, everything's still wild. But like you said, sometimes animal curiosity is is normal, they're just going to come right up to you, don't they? It is, yeah. And, um, and it's interesting that, um, you know, there's things like manta rays will, will definitely come and have a look. Um, but there's also sometimes uh, animals that can be quite territorial. So some fish are notorious for it, um, is they will attack a scuba diver, which is a lot bigger than them, um, because they're very territorial about their little sort of um, area that they might be um, living in or, or trying to build a nest. So, so something like a triggerfish um, will come up and give you a little nip. Um, and uh, some of them have kind of a big territory range that you, you might not be aware of if you just casually swim over it. And then you'll have this fish chasing you and getting up in your face and <laughs> trying to trying to give you a little bite. Um, which, yeah, so it, it's funny that sometimes you, you might try not to interact with something, but it might try and interact with you. Um, and there's, there's even things like, uh, you know, there's these fish that will attach themselves, like sort of stick on to larger animals. Um, and sometimes scuba divers get those fish coming up and trying to stick onto them as well. <laughs> That's, that's actually really adorable. I think I know exactly what fish you're talking about. They're in all the whale documentaries, I think. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Kita, I wanted to ask you, how are the reefs doing? Um, well, it varies. I mean, obviously, climate change is a, a huge issue. A lot of um, a lot of reefs do have um, serious coral bleaching events that happen. Um, it can vary with patterns like um, El Nino, La Nina um, events. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of concern about, um, the Great Barrier Reef and different parts of it are, are sort of doing okay and, and some parts of it are really struggling. Um, and, and things like storms can come through and also cause a lot of damage. So it, it kind of varies. Um, but, you know, we need serious climate action from the governments to kind of, um, prevent a lot of the, the damage that is happening. Yeah. I've seen, I think, all the, the Netflix documentaries on the topic. There was one, I, I can't remember the name right now, but it was really excellent. I didn't know anything about coral bleaching until I saw that documentary. So I, I would definitely advise the listeners of this podcast to go check out the documentaries on the ocean um, on Netflix to learn a little bit more about that. And I think the reason I asked you that question is because I know you studied mostly sponges, but I'm curious if um, the coral bleaching affects Obviously, it must affect the other creatures. Like, uh, or how are sponges affected by climate change? Uh, it can be hard to know because, again, um, sponges can be a little bit understudied. I think it, it kind of depends. But, but um, corals are like um, 
they provide so much of um, the environment for for other animals. You know, they they provide all of the um, the structure that that um, everything is sort of built around. So they're incredibly important. And if if the corals are um, not doing well, if if they're dying or they're um, bleaching in, in sort of yeah large areas, then it can of course affect all of the other animals that rely on um, on the corals as well. So it's it's kind of it can be it can be hard to know. You know there are areas where sponges dominate. You have these sort of sponge gardens, especially in sort of deep sea areas, um, and those shouldn't be too badly affected. But of course, um, you know the shallower um, coral reefs, uh, you know it could be a lot of um, issues for a lot of different creatures. Okay, yeah. How is it in your specific area? How how's the reef near you? Um, well, it's it's hard to know. I, I don't I don't go out and scuba dive um, too often, so I'm not sure um, the reefs closest to me. From what I've seen, they seem to be okay. Um, the people I know that do go out and and check them regularly, there are organizations like Coral Watch. Um, I think the the reefs kind of close to the Sunshine Coast seem to be doing all right for now. Um, but some parts of the Great Barrier Reef have, have really had it rough in the last few years, like kind of back-to-back -back bleaching events. Um, and it can take a long time to recover because um, corals grow and, and build slowly. Um, and so if, if whole areas are, are hit really hard, it can take a very long time for them to recover. Um, and there are efforts that people make to um, to kind of help mitigate that, but it, it, it is a big problem. Do you find that um, since more information has come out about the damage to the reefs that Australians in general are perhaps a little bit more environmentally conscious now? Yes, I mean, a, lo a lot of people are very aware of it um, and, and concerned about um, our reefs and, and concerned about um, a lot of the marine environment. But um, we, we really do kind of still need that to translate into government action because a lot of the time... Um, the Australian government really kind of isn't doing enough to um, prevent um, climate change from happening, and, and or, or sometimes you know there's there's effort being put into things that that maybe make a small difference, but not really a big difference in the long run. So so um, yeah, there's there's different efforts to maybe uh, help in particular areas, but overall I think um, Australia kind of needs to to do a bit more. Um, to, to protect the reefs. Yeah, it sounds like the governments around the world <laughs> could actually probably do a lot more. Yeah. Um, it's definitely not just Australia. Uh, I wanted to ask you before we go, because uh, we have a, a, you know, a little bit of, of time left, uh, I wanted to ask you about tardigrades, because I know you're yeah. a huge fan of them. Oh, I am. Um, one, of the qu one of the questions that I did have for you, because I know that you've, um, you've looked at land tardigrades, but have you also looked at marine tardigrades? Yeah, well, I've, I've done my best, but I haven't been lucky enough to find one yet, um, a marine tardigrade. Because they look so different to the terrestrial tardigrades. They have these really amazing feet. Um, they're just, yeah, quite different. They can have really spiky heads. You know, I, I've seen a lot of pictures of them and videos. Um, I'm very interested in them and I'd love to find one. Um, but it can be very challenging. Um, you know, I, I bought this uh, very fine sieve online that, um, you know, you can... There are, there are methods of trying to find marine tardigrades, so using fresh water to kind of shock them um, to maybe make them let go of sand grains, and then using the sieves to try and um, separate them from sand grains and then look at them um, under the microscope. And I've tried that, but I haven't quite found one yet. Um, but with tardigrades, it's, it's always the first one is the hardest to find, and then once you know what you're looking for, you will find them after that. Um, so once I found my first marine tardigrade, I'm sure it will get easier. Yeah, because it, it's funny. I was going to, uh, that's the reason I was asking is because I wanted to know how to find them. It's one thing that uh, I'm really anxious to do is find my first marine tardigrade. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to keep looking. I know that they have been found on the east coast of Canada. So um I think it's going to be one of those things where we just, you know, look through. I guess you look through the sand. Is that where you look? Yes. Well, it, it's um, I've I've read a lot from people who do find them, um, and I've 
Uh, I've tried myself, but I think it will just take a lot of time and patience. But I'd expect you could find them anywhere. Um, tardigrades really do get around. Um, they're in all environments. So I would I would assume that any beach would really have some. Um, so so some people I know will, will dig in the sand that's maybe not quite um, right on the tide line. So maybe just a little bit higher up the beach where it's sort of damp sand but a little bit dry and then maybe – get a few cups of that and just slowly look through it. Um, and they, they can cling to sand grains, um, so it can be kind of hard to see them. And as, as with most tardigrades, if they're kind of pretty transparent, um, it can be hard to see them. Um, so a lot of the time I think it's just having a Petri dish full of, um, you know, kind of spread out sand grains and then looking for movement and seeing what you can find. Um, so I have, I've spent quite a few hours looking for marine tardigrades, but no luck just yet. So where do you tend to find your terrestrial tardigrades? Um, well, sometimes in creek water, a um, little bit of sediment at the bottom of the creek um, is pretty good. Um, a lot of times moss, um, especially if it's moss that comes from, um, like if it's growing on a tree trunk or if it's on a rock, so there's lots sort of less dirt in it. I think it's quite, um, it makes it a little easier to find them. So just moistening some moss and squeezing it out um, and then slowly looking for movement and um, finding tardigrades that way. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I love ter terrestrial tardigrades. They're, they're really interesting. There's a cool variety of, of colors and sizes of them. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that I'll one day be able to add a marine tardigrade to that. I hope so. I definitely do. Uh, one of the things that I adore about you is that and I noticed that you're not doing it anymore for some reason so I wanted to ask you about it is that you make videos um you have a YouTube channel you have you made a lot of videos with tardigrades it, it was really my introduction to you was watching your YouTube uh and then following you on Twitter as well um so first question is why aren't you doing the YouTube videos anymore yes um well it was a little bit haphazard like I just um, I made a few YouTube videos when I found something kind of unusual with the tardigrades. So, um, you know, I found a tardigrade that had eaten a worm and then gotten injured in the process and, and slowly died after eating this worm. So that was like a really interesting event that I wanted to share with people. Um, and, and I was trying to uh, look at the really interesting moments when a tardigrade is dried out and then you add water and it slowly becomes active again. Um, so I made some videos like that. Um, so. Yeah, um, I suppose I, I haven't been as active with my microscope um, while I was doing honours. I was kind of focused on a lot of that stuff um, and a lot of life changes at the moment. So I haven't found as much of the time. But I, I do love making videos about, uh, you know, the interesting microscopic things I've found um, or also, you know, different um, sea creatures that I found. I'll, I'll put a video up. Um, I, I There was a video I was going to do about... Um, uh, well, I started doing one about tardigrade fossils because a lot of people aren't aware that there is a fossil record of tardigrades. It's a very short, um, like a small fossil record because, of course, finding fossils of microscopic animals is really hard. Um, so, so much respect to people who do it. It's quite amazing. Um, so, and then there was a, this really cool discovery of something that's related to tardigrades um, called mold pigs. Um, and I was planning to do a video on that um, really interesting um, paper, but I quite haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, so, you know, I will. The intention is there. I'll get back to it. I would love, love, love to watch that video. I actually, it's funny because I interviewed a paleolimnologist, um, Dr. Melina, and uh, she was telling me about diatom fossils, um, which are how they study, you know, past histories of lakes which yes. is absolutely fascinating. So I guess it would make sense that there would be tardigrade fossils. Yes, and, and it's it's quite amazing because sometimes uh, they're found in amber. Um, and then there's there's people who also study phosphatized um, little microfossils as well, which is an interesting kind of rare process that happens. Um, and then they look at them with a scanning electron microscope. And it's a, a kind of a really interesting process, but... I'm quite amazed by the people who do that kind of research. It must be very interesting. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you wouldn't really expect that there are people studying fossils of microscopic animals, but there are, and it's, it's incredibly interesting. 
And this recent find of mold pigs was, um, I think it was the Dominican Republic. They, they found this amber with a heck of a lot of them. Um, and, and what's interesting is that they're believed to be extinct. Um, and, but they're quite similar to tardigrades in a way. So, so it's surprising that they haven't persisted or at least haven't been found. Um, if they have survived, maybe they were just, you know, confined to a very specialized environment. Um, but yeah, very interesting. Absolutely. Well, one of the reasons I was asking about the YouTube is because I find that you have a keen talent for communication. And oh, I know that, you know, science communication is a really hot topic right now. It's huge. It's a growing, uh, it's a growing, I was going to say industry, and I guess I would be correct in saying so, uh, that it, it is a growing industry. And I'm, I'm just wondering, is that something that you enjoy doing? Is that something that you um, aspire to do more of? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I love talking to people and, and sharing um, the, the cool things that I've learned, um, although I know it's not necessarily um, an interest that everyone shares. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's great when when scientists uh, talk about their research or talk about their passions, um, and it, it it's very good for the general public to to hear about all the interesting research that that's happening or to get a greater understanding of um, different topics. But it it can be um, a little bit tricky to do effectively. So I wouldn't necessarily call myself a science communicator. Um, more that I, I'm, you know, a fan of, of lots of uh, research and I like to talk about it and I like to share my interests. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult thing to do well for, for science communicators. And, um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of people on, on Twitter who have sort of a, a large outreach and, and like to really engage with people. Um, and I like to engage as well. Um, and, and I would like to do more sort of videos and, and be a bit more involved um, as well. So, yeah, something I, I will sort of. I do plan to do a bit more of yeah. Well, I have to admit, I, I would love to have you back on the show just because I feel like we've only touched the surface of, of what is marine biology and what is what are this all these sea creatures. And I, what I hope, Kita, is that I hope that you get invited to do other people's podcasts and do more media interviews because, again, I really think that, you know, like you said, there are people who are gifted at commun communicating their passions and interests and it's hard to communicate science in a way that is understood by non-scientists yes and I, and I think sometimes when when you're uh, you you really pursue an interest a long way um, it, it can be easy to forget that a lot of people are unfamiliar with things that you tend to take for granted um, so for example when I, I took my friend rock pulling for the first time um, He'd, he'd never really seen a brittle star or something, which I just completely take for granted. I've seen them for such a long time. Um, and he was so fascinated by things like um, uh, seeing a hermit crab that was bright red because he just didn't know that they could come in kind of bright colors like that. Um, or, you know, one that was kind of faintly blue. Or um, and, and I knew he'd never seen a sea slug before, so I was very happy to introduce him um, to quite a large um, sea slug. And, and so it, it's kind of fun. But, but yeah, you can... You can sometimes forget that there are lots of sea creatures that um, people just aren't really familiar with, um, and and uh, yeah, something like the fact that a sponge is an animal is 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 a simple concept. But of course, if you've never really thought about a sponge, you know why would you uh, know what it is really? Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, I, it's I certainly fun had not to kind of share that knowledge with people. Yeah, I, I mean, like like you said, it's it's. Uh... It's one of those simple things that I, I didn't even think about asking you if a sponge was an animal or a plant. I had assumed it was a plant. Yeah, so... it's, well, it's easy to assume. There's a, whole, there's a lot of uh, marine creatures that do kind of seem a lot like plants. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, and I, you know, I, it would be horrible if I didn't ask you about one thing that is not science related. I do know that you play the piano. And yes, I have yes. listened. I have listened and I've watched your YouTube videos, uh, you know, playing. I think it, you played Beethoven and, and uh, Ludovico. Um, and I mean, how long have you been playing? Because you're, you're amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, I think I had started lessons when I was about seven. Um, and then after high school, I kind of stopped playing for a long time. Um, but I, I recently got a piano again. And so I'm, I'm, 
I've relearned a lot of pieces and I've been learning new pieces and it's just it's really fun it's a nice pursuit um and I I know my YouTube channel is a bit random it has <laughs> a, a strange kind of mix of videos and, and now piano videos but but I like you know sharing sharing music that I'm um learning to play and it's a lot of fun um there's a piece I'm learning at the moment um that's I've been playing every day for the last like four months um and it's still very challenging um but but yeah it's a lot of fun does music fulfill you in the same way as science does or does it fulfill you in, in like a completely different way um a slightly different way I suppose I, I just like um I like having a bit of a creative outlet um I very occasionally uh try and write a song or two um and it's it's fun to learn and, and kind of I like to push myself you know it, it's fun trying to sort of compete with yourself and, and slowly get better and build some different skills um, so yeah, I've always loved playing the piano. Um, in the last year and a half, I've been learning to play a bit of ukulele as well, um, which is quite fun. Um, all through high school, I used to play the trumpet and, and I was in a jazz band. And so it's it's nice having um, yeah a creative outlet. For sure. I, I totally know how, that, how you feel about that. <laughs> um, so what's next for you? Um, that's something I'm trying to decide at the moment. I um, since finishing honors, I'm I'm kind of contemplating doing a PhD or um, maybe trying to to work in a different lab. Um, there's a, a few different places around Brisbane that are doing interesting research, um, so I'm kind of yeah wondering what I should do next. Um, whether I should keep pursuing research or just be involved in sort of more practical um, lab work at the moment. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not sure yet, but hopefully hopefully something fun is on the horizon. And I'm sure that in the meantime, you're gonna, you're just going to keep exploring, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Keto Williams, it was a pleasure having you on the show. I've learned a lot more about the cool creatures that live in the oceans. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to answer my, cur my curious questions. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. Thank you.